Um, so thank you so much for coming to this session, one of the last sessions of the day. So thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, my name is Anna Whitson. I sit at UNDP as part of the Yadi Secretariat in New York. And um, I'm going to be moderating this session entitled Yadi's Missing Links in Latin America Outreach Opportunities. Um, so today, I think it's going to be a really interesting session. Um, we're going to kind of explore some of the challenges um, that we as an initiative um, and we as kind of development cooperation publishers, providers, users have um, in engaging with Latin America and kind of look at some of the ways um, for how we can overcome this, what are the challenges, what are the kind of um, empirical ways that some of our speakers have assessed this and, and some, some ways that they see that we might be able to overcome. So we have uh, three great speakers for you today. Um, we have our colleague, Luisa Mateo, who's a professor at Pontifica Universidad Católica de Sao Paulo. So um, welcome, Luisa. Also, Julio Lopez, co-founder at Detalat from Ecuador. And Jenny Berganza, who is an M&E analyst, analyst at UNDP, colleague of ours in Honduras. So welcome to all of you. So maybe we'll just go to the next slide. So you have all probably seen uh, this slide many times by now, but just a reminder of kind of how we um, are hoping to run the sessions. Um, we really want to make this interactive and be able to discuss, you know, um, the, the barriers to entry, the challenges with all of you. Um, so feel free to at any time ask questions via the chat box, and we'll definitely have a lot of time today um, for interactive Q&A um, with panelists uh, and panelist discussion. Also just a reminder that um, I hope we have lots of colleagues joining us from Latin America. So we do have live interpretation um, simultaneous into English, Spanish, and French. Um, it would be great also if um, everyone could just make sure their Zoom display name includes their name and organization so we kind of know who's in the room and, um, and can get that lively conversation going. So we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Sarah, my colleague who's putting the slides forward for us. Great. Um, so just a little bit of an introduction to this session. Um, we're really trying to open a discussion um, and kind of dig into outreach opportunities and opportunities to engage with Latin America um, through what we can offer here in IADI. So we're really going to kind of hear about how um, re-engaging with these, this kind of key missing link um, can help bolster the transparency sector in Latin America. Um, and increase you know, the utility of Yadi data um, for its data users, stakeholders, um, um, and incentivize publishers to publish um, more data, better data on their activities in Latin America. So what we really wanna do is kind of think through and demystify these kind of barriers to entry um, for becoming engaged in Yadi in Latin America, um, and kind of examine the reasons why countries are, are using or not using Yadi data. So this is a one hour session, as I said, the last um, session block of the day. So thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, and again, we want it to be both informative and interactive. So lots of time for Q&A and, and please drop your questions in the chat box at any time. Um, so I think we'll go just quickly to the next slide. I'm almost done speaking, I promise. Um, we are going to, we're closing out the introduction now um, and we're gonna have a kind of scene setting presentation by our colleague, Luisa on kind of the state of open data and transparency in Brazil uh, slash Latin America. So kind of what is the current state of play, challenges, solutions, um, and she's very much coming at it from this kind of academic research perspective. And we'll have some time for Q&A um, with Lisa. Um, part two will be a little bit more of a deep dive, so specific country perspective, looking at two case studies um, from Honduras and Ecuador. So Jenny and Julio will come in um, at that point. And then at the end, we should have some time hopefully for panel discussion um, and a Q&A with the audience. Um, so we can kind of bring all these presentations together. That's time for the participants to ask questions and all of this good stuff. But I think we will start next slide, please, just with a quick poll. Actually, we have two polls, just to kind of understand um, who was in the room and kind of where everyone's coming from. So launch the first poll here. Um, and just wondering what constituency you represent. So are you from a part of government, a multilateral, bilateral, civil society, philanthropy, academia, or other? So really interesting to kind of see the mix of perspectives we might have, especially when we bring in um, conversation later on. 
So maybe we'll just give it five more seconds for everyone to answer. And then I think, perfect, we can close this out. Great. Um, so it looks like really good participation from civil society. We also have um, a mix of bilateral and multilateral organizations and partner country governments, academia and others. So good, really mix of um, lots of people from, from different organizations, great. I think we'll go on to the second poll just really quickly. Great. So this is kind of where you're based. So we're just wondering, you know, where in the world are you coming from? Um, what kind of, you know, office are you working from? What kind of perspective are, are you kind of bringing into these conversations? So yeah, if you could just let us know really quickly um, where you're coming from, that would be great. I'm not sure if we're going to have any Antarctica representation, but there's always a chance. So we'll give it maybe like five more seconds and then we will close it out. Ooh, so it looks like we have a very, um, I'm not sure if others can see this, I can see the results here. Um, it looks like we have a pretty almost equal split between colleagues from Europe and colleagues from South America. So lots of um, people in the room um, from, from the region where the discussion is at hand and also very strong representation from Europe. So. Hello also to all our European colleagues. Great. Great. Okay. So I think um, with that, we can um, go into um, our first of the series of presentations today. Um, I just wanted to kind of remind the um, presenters that we um, have a limited time and I definitely want to get to some discussion um, at the end of the session. So please um, keep your um, remarks hopefully to you know six to seven minutes and we'll have some time, a few minutes for QA after every um, presentation. Um, and then also just let us know when you need your slides advanced and, and have to do that for you. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the session, uh, Luisa Moteo, who uh, is a professor at Pontifica Universidad Católica de Sao Paulo uh, from Brazil. So her, her, her presentation is going to be, again, this kind of setting the scene overall background um, on the importance of open data and transparency in Brazil and Latin America a little bit more widely. Um, and looking at it from this academic and research perspective. So over to you, Luisa, and thank you so much uh, for joining. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Good afternoon, you all. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I couldn't set the background, <laughs> but I'll move forward anyway. Uh, like I said, I'm Luisa Mateo. I'm professor of international relations at PUC São Paulo, Brazil. I'm very pleased to be here to discuss the status of uh, aid transparency in Latin America and Brazil as well. I would like to thank Julia Goldman and, and Sander Hees for the invitation to participate in this session today. Uh, I will share with you some thoughts on the importance of data availability to the research community mostly. For starters, it's never too much to recall that development cooperation is a political field, meaning that the definition of uh, the concept of foreign aid or development assistance uh, itself and what it is to be measured is highly political. Development cooperation is a multi-billion dollar system, an expanding one. It is common to focus on the aid flow from north to south, but also the other way around, there is a large portion of aid resources that is actually retained in operation costs or subcontracting of companies and civil society organizations originated in donor countries. South South Corporation has also expanded abruptly in the last couple of decades, enlarging aid money flows between developing countries. The aid industry is becoming more and more complex in terms of its reach, the number and nature of actors involved and multiple possible arrangements in financing and implementing programs and projects. Recent increase in triangular cooperation, public-private partnerships and vertical funds uh, mark a new era of development cooperation beyond the North-South divide. Important aid recipients such as Haiti or Afghanistan that are part of post-conflict and post-catastrophes reconstruction schemes have to manage a multifaceted scenario of thousands of aid activities funded by dozens of donors working with less 
coordination than one may expect. A growing range of new intermediaries are involved in development uh, and humanitarian assistance, as many programs and projects are in fact implemented by third parties, third party organizations such as local NGOs. Any proposal to elevate aid transparency should involve the new implementers as well. The diagnosis only reinforces the importance of the quality of information available, meaning the importance of the re reliability of aid data, transparency and accountability commitments from donor and aid organizations. As a researcher, I've dedicated my recent work to the study of American foreign assistance, which put me in a place of relative ease in the sense that the US ranks well in aid transparency indicators. Uh, well, at least when it comes to aggregated data and budget composition. It was when I began to teach uh, development cooperation course at PUC Sao Paulo that I realized how difficult it is to draw comparative analysis on different donors, especially when we try to compare aid levels all out of the bubble of OECD DAC traditional donors. That reinforces the importance of standardization of definitions and common methods for measurement of aid levels and impact assessment. Not to entirely discard the consolidated normative and monitoring arrangement, especially DEX ODA that has played since the 60s an important role in harmonizing definitions, instruments and models shared by developed countries. Even OECD has elevated its efforts in tracking aid fluxes beyond ODA, such as OFFS, other, other official flows, and non-ODA non flows, South South Corporation, private aid, and decentralized cooperation. Another innovation to take into account is the measurement of TOST, official support for sustainable de development, consolidated after 2030 agenda. TOST represents a new model for aid tracking, encompassing public and private resources regarding SDGs, including South South Corporation, triangular cooperation and private sector engagement. From the Global South perspective, development cooperation is complexified by the re-emergence of developing uh, donors with highly fragmented sets of definitions, practices and data reporting frameworks. Other than ODA and DEX transparency norms, South South corporate cooperation is poorly institutionalized. The fragile governance of South South Corporation translates into the absence of shared definitions and a unified database for data collection. The fragmentation in South South Corp uh, Corporation comprises political and technical challenges, such as the, dif the difficulty to measure modalities um, of technical cooperation and knowledge transfer in, in monetary terms, domestic institutional fragility in order to set definitions and gather good quality data, bureaucratic dispersion with many departments and agencies involved in development cooperation without a central organization, and internationally with many, uh, the lack of a comprehensive forum to organize data collection since most South South uh, Corporation um, actors do not report to DEC. The so-called emerging donors, such as Brazil, Mexico, to stick with Latin American largest, established in the last decades their own definitions for development cooperation. Since 2010, the Brazilian Institute for Applied Economic Research, in partnership with Brazilian Cooperation Agency, has published the report COBRADE, Cooperação Brasileira para o Desenvolvimento Internacional, setting a very particular def definition of development cooperation that captures the specificities of the federal government involvement and budget accounts. The demand for a well-established reporting system comes from the con context of a much larger engagement, uh, uh, Brazilian engagement in South South Corporation since the 2000s. The budget alone escalated from $150 million in 2005 to over $1 billion in 2010. After a total of five Cobradi reports published so far, many challenges remain, mostly because data collection depends on the adherence of Brazilian domestic institutions, such as ministries and a lot of uh, other agencies. Cobradi covers mostly 
a technical and scientific cooperation training offered by Brazilian government and public institutes, contributions to multilateral organizations and peacekeeping operations, humanitarian assistance and in-country refugee expenses. It, do not, it does not cover private assistance, decentralized cooperation, foreign debt relief, nor concessional credit from public banks, an example of export credits from BNDES. On one hand, Cobradi report is interesting because it captures precisely the par particularities of Brazilian development cooperation, but it also adds to the fragmentation of South South cooperation, just, uh, just like I mentioned. Other than individual efforts, it's important to acknowledge also some regional initiatives that try to track down South South and triangular cooperation, such as the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, CEPAL, and Ibero-American General Secretariat. Well, to close up, I leave you with uh, some final remarks from the perspective of academia. That, uh, these are some of my main concerns as a researcher. First, the difficulty to compare so many different methodologies created to describe and measure development cooperation. Uh, and in, in that sense, comprehensive efforts uh, such as IATI, IATIS are very welcome in the sense that they allow us to propose new research lines in comparative terms. Second, more, da more data and even more transparency in reporting the data does not mean better data and more effective development cooperation or humanitarian aid. My concern is that we could be trapped by the mirage of data governance that reduces the political content of, of development cooperation, describing it in technical terms. It's not only about data, it's about political commitment to aid coordination, local ownership and empowerment of local communities and vulnerable populations in developing countries. I would like also to emphasize the importance of disaggregated data, which really illuminates a delivery chains and help us to answer the questions. Where does the money go? And who benefits from complex aid schemes in recipient and donor countries? Uh, and, and help us to better understand uh, how the, this resource flows uh, goes and how we could improve aid impact and prevent corruption and money waste in aid industry. And, and finally, it's important to overcome large gaps in data availability. I would like to stress the difficulty in, in analyzing some of the largest emerging donors in South South cooperation, uh, for instance, China. The role played by Chinese aid is growing in volume and will have both economic and political impact in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. Well, I think my time's up. <laughs> I just uh, uh, took uh, too much of, of the time for the session. I thank you for your attention and we'll continue our conversation moving forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Luisa. Um, I don't see uh, questions in the waiting room, but I just wanted to call out that we did have a comment. Um, the mirage of data is a real challenge in development cooperation. So just a comment from the chat on that. Um, I have a follow-up question for you, <laughs> um, if you don't mind. So, I mean, I think your presentation really spoke to me. I mean, working in development cooperation for quite a few years, and I think, you know, there are a few trends in Latin America. Um, obviously, we have this combination of kind of more traditional partner recipient countries and also emerging donors. Um, as you said, also, you know, South-South cooperation being increasingly important, but also hard to quantify, right? Monetarily hard to monetize um, and with little appetite to do that um, because a lot of it is technical cooperation. And then we also have this dimension, I think, of which happens with many partner countries in this kind of allergy to the effectiveness conversation somewhat. Um, thinking it's kind of a Trojan horse for, you know, reducing ODA spending and these kind of things. So given all of that, I just wonder if you have any thoughts, and this is a difficult question, so not to put you on the spot, but if you have any thoughts on how we might be able to incentivize some of those countries, whether those are partner countries to engage, you know, with the data we have in Yadi, or whether it's how we incentivize emerging donors from Latin America to engage with these kind of international standards or with Yadi more specifically. 
I think the, the, the way to move forward in engaging emerging donors probably is to explore the, the, the dubious role that they play in, in development cooperation, which means that they remain a large recipients of aid while they expand their, their role in providers of soft soft cooperation. So if you think that they uh, will would benefit from uh, from these standards being IATI or, or even DAC standards of uh, reporting aid and South South cooperation, etc. Uh, in order to access uh, uh, aid, to continue to receive aid and being part of larger schemes of uh, triangular cooperation, which is very important to countries that try to, uh, to elevate their, their role in the global stage, such as Brazil, such as Argentina, Mexico, and others, and try to do that in order, uh, in, in order to uh, establish new partnerships, uh, not only regionally, which they do, but also with traditional donors and ac accessing also not only ODA from traditional donors, but also accessing uh, funds in public partners, uh, public private partnerships and uh, private aid uh, in general. And also I think that uh, to overcome these uh, difficulties that sometimes uh, comes up to dialogue with uh, central governments, for instance, in Brazil, we have a very difficult political scenario and our foreign policy is not so much investing in, in, in South South corporations such as we did uh, in the past. I think one alternative as well is to uh, to bet on local uh, local uh, actors, governments. Decentralized corpora uh, cooperation is growing, and in Brazil, uh, I see a lot of uh, new and innovative and very promising initiatives being. Uh, being conducted by uh, local uh, governments on the level of the states, on the level of the cities, etc. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's a great, great answer. Really, kind of uh, helps kind of engage the the wider um, conversation around around these issues. So. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have a couple other questions in the chat, but I think I'll save those for the panel in a little bit. Um, so if we can just move on now, I think we have two of the case studies. So looking a little bit at a deeper dive into um, use of Yadi data or engagement, potential engagement with Yadi in Latin America, taking two more concrete cases as examples from Honduras and Ecuador. Um, so I think we will start with Jenny Bredeganza from the UNDP office in Honduras, um, and then we'll hear from um, Julio Lopez um, from Ecuador. So I think over to you, um, Jenny. Okay. Well, thanks and good uh, good morning and good afternoon, depending on where <laughs> where you are. And. Uh, um, and so, as they say, I'm Jenny Berganza. I am the monitoring and evaluation analyst for the country office here in Honduras. And we can start now. And regarding the open data and transparency in Honduras, we can start talking about some legal and institutional key elements. First of all, we have the law of, on transparency and access to public information. Uh, it was a law created in 2006 and uh, with some reforms in 2007. Uh, the main objectives of this law are guarantee, guarantee this, the right to the citizen, of the citizens to participate in the management of public affairs, to make the transparency of public institutions effective, ensure the protection, the classification, and the security of public information and the respect for restriction on access to information as cl and classified as confidential or reserved for, for the government. Then uh, when we have the Institute for Access to Public Information, the EIP. <laughs> it, it, it was established by the law 
actually well the, the, the law on transparency and it starts to operate its operation in the next year in 2000, 2008 uh, it is uh, the concentrated of public administration hopefully and it is responsible to ensuring the compliance with the law on transparency and is responsible also responsible to implementing the national public information system and this national uh, uh, this, this information system has five components uh, the main component could be the transparency portal uh, the actually by now we have more than 100 foreign national institutions in publishing their information in in, in that portal and um, uh, at the end i will talk about some issues about the 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 the, the portal but we have it uh, the second component is the Ele honduran electronic information system which is a um, if you don't don't find don't find the, the information in the transparency portal, you can uh, ask for that information in the electronic system in, in the electronic information system. Then we have the citizen attention centers. Uh, there are mobile at, uh, attention centers, and you can also ask for information there. Uh, then we have the virtual world learning platform. It is. Mm, mm, it's more like um, little, um, the kind of uh, um, information, a uh, kind of models uh, of learning for the people. Uh, actually, I, I didn't know that, that it exists until a few days ago. And then we have the Center for Studies and Research uh, that only have five studies published by now. Also, you know, regarding the 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 agenda, the 2030 agenda. Uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, we have the presidential results based management system. It is managed by the Secretariat of General Coordination of Government, and that 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 secretariat is um, as, uh, the second before the the second institution before the president and it controls coordinates actually all the the rest of the ministries and secretariats here in Honduras and they are in charge to support the follow-up of, of the institutional planning and um, they have a, about the system we have mentioned some small progress in, in accountability in the last two years uh, they have created the evaluation radar, the official repository of public policies, and they, the last year, they they start to, to monitoring of the 2030 national agenda. It, it, it is a, a actually is a, a very a very friendly site. It's a, I I can and this this last three are, are very friendly. And I can leave you the links uh, to the site in the chat box, so, so you can take a look later for of this, of this, these, these, these topics. Uh, the next, the next, uh, and maybe the most important uh, uh, platform here in Honduras for open data could be uh, the cooperation management platform. It was developed by a multi-donor fund, uh, and it was implemented by UNDP in Honduras between 2011 and 2018. It now is management completely by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, and it's a entire chapter of the National Policy of Cooperation for Sustainable Development. Uh, and it is, it is uh, that's the, that last is very important because uh, in, the, in, in the policy we already have some regulation for the for the the cooperate, international cooperation. Some highlights about this uh, 
PGC, I will call it a PGC to the platform, in Spanish es Plataforma de Gestión de la Cooperación, so we, we, we call it PGC. Uh, some highlights are, it was designed according to the IARI standards. Uh, the information is quarterly updated by the partners because it is required and established in the national policy. So we have to, all the, 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 the local partners have to, to uh, up, update the, the data in, 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 this, in this platform. And by now, there are more than 200 partners updating the information in the platform. So we, can have, we can list uh, international cooperation, private sector, um, and some banks, some academia. And yeah, we have a, 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 a lot of, of, of partners publishing. One thing. The information is up to date for internal use, but not for public use. And, and it is not intended. It, it, it is, maybe it is a gap we, the, the platform is have. So you, I have a user, so I can, I can see all the information, but, but when people look at the, the, the public site, information, the most recent information is maybe in the last year. So we, we have a, a gap of information almost for a year, right? And now, the, the last thing I have to talk because I'm from UNDP, it is uh, the, our commitment with the IARI. So, uh, can we see the next slide, please? Uh, what do we do? We, we work uh, recording and updating the, uh, the information of program and projects. Uh, we have uh, the open, open UNDP, so, so it, uh, we have to do it uh, every month and also verify the quality of information. At least we work with some internal training, mainly with new staff about the UNDP engagement with the initiative and the importance of transparency and information disclosure. Uh, we have some statistics and we are working now in, 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 in the exercise of uh, the quality of information and uh, the country office have uh, a good level. We are near to the the corporate target, so uh, it is very important for us. Um, well, by my side and by now, it's all I have. So thanks for your attention, and if you have any question, I will be here. Great. Thank you so much. That's a pretty useful overview, I think, of, of the, the landscape um, at the country level. So I do have a follow-up question for you. Um, so you said that your um, cooperation management platform, the PGC, it was originally built on IADI data, um, or the, excuse me, on the IADI standard. So I wonder, kind of a two-pronged question, um, did it ever, or are there ever any plans to you know, formally integrate it with Yadi data, either you know, via integration or a manual integration? Um, and if not, kind of, were there challenges that you saw when you were trying to use Yadi data that would be relevant for this group to know about in terms of how we can maybe overcome so, some of those challenges? So it seems like there was some buy-in at the beginning that the IAD standard was really representing what you wanted to capture at the country level, but maybe things have shifted or the IAD data, you know, maybe isn't as useful for you now for, for certain reasons. I guess that, that's my main question. Um, like, are you using IAD data as a complement to national systems? How, um, and if not, why basically? Um, and have you attempted to do that in the past? Uh, well, uh, the sorry, 
I don't know if because the 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 platform is is uh, completely completely managed by the 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 ministry. We have no control about that now. We only uh, put our information there. It, it could be actually it it, it could be it, it will be very important for us. Have a, a, a have a, a a kind of link with the Yari and and, and, and our system and the platform for uh, of the of the government. Uh, if uh, I can I can talk to uh, I have only two years less than two years working here and. But I think the, uh, that exercise to to link the PGC directly with Yari is is a is a, a, a job that was made already. It could be nice. It could be a great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so I don't see any other. Um questions in the chat. So I think we'll move on to Julio at this point. Um, so I think Julio is going to give us a bit of an introduction um, to the state of access to information and open data in Ecuador, um, and then kind of the use of international cooperation data like Yadi. So a little bit about the, the examples of use, challenges, and maybe some opportunities as well. Um, and I see Angel has a hand up, but maybe we can tackle that after Julio's presentation. Um, so we'll come back to you on help, no problem. Um, but over to you, Julio. Uh, thank you, Anna. Can you confirm that you're listening to me properly? <laughs> yeah, great, thanks. Uh, well, hello everybody. So as Anna mentioned, uh, my name is Julio and I'm from Data Lab. We are a non-for-profit, uh, an Ecuadorian non-for-profit. We've been working in the data and technology side for in the last five years. So our approach is the effective use of data and technology for social impact. Uh, in this case, uh, my slides will be a little bit on, on the open data uh, access, access to information uh, history we have had in the country. In the last, as you can see in my slides, our law is um, on running since 20, 20, uh, 2004. And recently in the last two years, we've been officially having a, an open data policy and guide in the government. This only applies for the central government. So basically in, in that lab, we've been working closely with the government with these policies. And at the moment, we are still uh, expecting to have a new open data portal in the country where different new data, data sets uh, will be uploaded by different organizations, uh, public organizations we've been also working with. Um, it is interesting because as, as, as my colleagues mentioned before, not all the entities complain with open data policy at the country at the moment because it's new and unknown. And also we uh, recently have a new national development plan. As you know, our government is in, in, in uh, functions from uh, three months ago. So we have a new government in the country. So that's also meaning we will have new policies and new uh, regulations coming in, in the next years or months. Uh, Luckily, uh, this government still promotes transparency and also the use of digital government strategies, which is really good in terms of having this access to digital data, right? Um, if you want to see more, uh, we have more information on our website that is in Spanish, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure you can use um, Google Translator uh, to see some of this information we have published there. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so... Um, if looking a little bit more into in, in detail in the Ecuadorian case, we do have three different platforms that we can get access to international aid or international cooperation data. So the first one is a, a map of international cooperation. Uh, unfortunately, this website is not open data. We have to look into the details of the projects and its PDF formats. And if you want to download the, the table, it's not possible. It's an aggregated data. We do not have uh, information regarding every project, for example. We uh, are running at the moment a, a, a training, a capacity training uh, for students on the use of uh, international cooperation data. With, uh, in, we have a, an agreement with a local network on international cooperation here in Ecuador. And through this, uh, we, we've been running this uh, training in the last two months and the students have been using these different platforms and also the IAPT platform, which is really good in terms of having 
them to see what what they can expect in terms of uh, having access to cooperation data. The second one is the South South Cooperation Portal. We do have one, but it doesn't have any data on it. So it's it's interesting that we have it available, but there's no data. You can navigate it. Uh, I can provide you that. I, I didn't put here the the links, but I could uh, update this, this uh, slide. But you can uh, navigate this platform, and unfortunately, there's no data there. So, and we do have some really interesting South South cooperation projects. As uh, Luisa mentioned, triangular cooperation and South South cooperation has been gaining momentum in, in Latin America, given that many countries in our region are moving from uh, low income countries into middle income countries. So, therefore, we are also having that challenge in mind. We won't have more international uh, aid coming in the, in the following months, obviously the pandemic has changed some reality. So we will expect also changes there. And the last thing is, is related to this case of COVID-19 situation. We do have a receive assistance and aid data portal, which is really interesting, but it's also a PDF. So we've been trying to, you know, extract data, to, try, trying to scrap some data from these websites to, to, to be able to have an actual uh, machine readable data set that can be can be used by, by other people, right? So this is some just, just to give you a little bit of the case study in Ecuador. And moving on to the next slide, please. Um, this is some of the challenges that we have found using uh, also AI, uh, IIT's data, given that it's, it's from our perspective, we need more awareness in terms of what data is available in the platform in the region. That's something I think should, uh, should be a, a, a priority, I believe. Also, we do have some initiatives in the region that have been doing this work as well. For example, Publish What You Pay, the, IIT, the, the IITI, which is Destructive Industry Transparency Initiative, has also been in many countries in the region. Also, we do have these open data policies in many of the countries. Ourselves in Ecuador, we do have some data available on that. But also, I think we should look into what we can do with, with this data that is available and and in the specific sectors, in specific uh, cases that we can use that. Also, as we have been doing this in the last two months, we believe that training on how to use this data platform is key because not many people know what data is available first, but secondly, how to use the assistance, right? It's really, it's really useful that we have the PDFs uh, on step-by-step toolkits or guidelines on how to use the data, what variables are, are available, what specific uh, uh, in sources or, or, or um, uh, amounts of money uh, means because you have different uh, variables re regarding what's uh, the amounts of money going into the countries, right? As we, we see in the previous uh, sessions in, in, in the seminar, it's, it's really interesting to see that it's, it's very technical. So for that, journalists, civil society researchers need to get uh, familiar with this uh, te technical uh, language in, in, in a way, and also what data is available there, right? Because as I think we've been trying to compare the data that is in, in the platforms with, with our country data, we see many gaps because in the, in the official data in the country, they only publish what is going through the official cooperation agreements, right? But there's a lot of international cooperation going through uh, out away from this. For example, uh, specific cooperations we have with other international NGOs that is becoming with funding from other uh, funders and stuff. This is really not capturing any of this. So for, for, for the, um, in, in terms of going into this comparative analysis, I do think that IIT's data is really key in order to do this comparative analysis by sectors, by projects, by countries. For example, one of our students did uh, a specific country analysis using both databases, which is going to be interesting, the, 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 the results they will get. The results will be available later this month. So I, I also committed to write a blog post on this with the uh, IIT team. So we will see that later. Uh, but that's something I think should be improved, right? And, and from our side, being used in this data, it's really rich data sets that we have there. So we do need to, to go deeper into that, dive deeper into the data to see what's uh, available for every country, right? For the case of Ecuador, it's really interesting the projects that are published there. Also seeing what, what international organizations have been published data there. Um, but I don't think it's been used much in our case. So we do think it's, it's more training will be needed. And luckily we've been doing this in the last months and we are really expecting to run these trainings later again. So, 
that's something we, we are committed to do as well. So that's from our perspective, and I hope that we can have a, a discussion or, or any other questions, and I'll be here to, to talk about this. Thank you. Great, thank you, Julio. That's really interesting perspective, and I think that confirms a lot of the things that we you know are thinking about as the Adi Secretariat in terms of how do we make this data more accessible to people that aren't such technical users? How do we provide additional training? How do we make this data really um, be able to kind of reach wider? So I definitely want to shout out right now the, the new country development finance data tool that's just been launched um, a few months ago, um, which is a new EADI tool um, to specifically be able to download um, data by um, transaction at the transaction the budget level for specific countries um, and then a workbook that actually translates that data very easily into something that is much more useful I think for um, non-technical users much more useful to give you a general overview of um, the EADI data that we have the, the data that's coming into the country that's been published to EADI so definitely would uh, I'm sure we can share that in the chat would definitely would encourage you to also take a look at that and everyone really in this in this um, session to take a look at that because I think we're really starting to make strides with the audience and just you know to complement what you said I think it's really important to have more accessible ways of using the data especially as we try to kind of reach a wider audience um, um, of civil society journalists like you said all these additional actors at the country level um, thanks much for that. I think we have no questions in the chat, but I wanted to go back to Angel, who's been waiting very patiently with his hand up. Um, so Angel, please come in with your question. Hi, Anna. Uh, it's not a question. It's about the question um, you asked to Jenny, because I'm in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Honduras, and I'm in charge of the PGC right now. <laughs> so I can answer the, the question you you asked her. She did very well. Everything uh, she told you about the PGC it's, uh, was very accurate. I just took cover a couple of months ago. And yes, the platform is uh, it's on, under IADI's regulations. It was made by the Development Gateway. Uh, but uh, the problem we have right now, it's our version of the platform is it's old it's like four or five years old so we already held a meeting with the development gateway personnel because we are looking to update the platform to the latest version we have a lot of uh, a lot of options that we don't have in the platform for example to give you a small example we don't have a climate change option in the platform and also the reason i'm participating here and I will continue on uh, further participations with IARI. It's because, yes, we want the platform to be part of uh, IARI, uh, to share the information with, uh, with IARI. As far as I know, before me, no one has uh, participated in, uh, in IARI's uh, meetings. So, but, uh, but I'll be here from uh, now on. So that's that was exactly the purpose of this session. So, really excited yeah. to hear that um, and that you're seeing some value here. Um, and just to say, um, just in the chat also, um, Sarah reminded us, or one of my colleagues reminded us that this CDFD tool that we were just talking about, um, the country development finance data tool also will be available in Spanish shortly and Portuguese. So just to flag that to you on Hill and other co um, colleagues at the country level that that I think will be a really critical tool for kind of expanding the reach um, of the ID data at the country level. So definitely would encourage you all to, to kind of check that out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, I just wanted to see, does anyone else want to kind of raise a hand or chat in the chat box um, in terms of any questions for our panelists or for the, the general kind of participants in the session? Give it five seconds here, maybe. <laughs> Anyone wants to be brave. Okay, um, I think we need to end in about five minutes um, because we have the closing session coming directly after this, but I just wanted to, maybe have each of the panelists um, give us some um, additional last thoughts um, on um, a call to action maybe that you have um, for either the development cooperation community as a whole um, or for the IATI community on how you think um, we could better engage with um, stakeholders, national level stakeholders um, at the country level to kind of bring them further into this fold. Um, 
And then let me just quickly actually answer a question in the chat um, before we go into that, give you a second to think on your answers. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, is the Adi platform going to register a specific chapter on private cooperation in Latin America? Um, so in terms of Yadi as a as an initiative, um, we you know we depend on our, our membership and our community members um, in terms of you know anything basically that is happening kind of at the, the, the country and regional level. So no plans right now for us to do very specific, specific private cooperation work in Latin America, but definitely something that we're open to um, chatting with the community about and we can definitely follow up with you um, to hear more about your ideas for that. Um, so thanks for that that last question. Um, so back to the panelists, just um, if any um, final calls to action you have for the development cooperation community, the Addy community on, you know, bringing um, Latin America more into this fold. Um, so maybe we can just go in the same order. So maybe over to Louisa, if you have any thoughts. Well, uh, would uh, I would say that uh, academia and researchers uh, could uh, be very helpful in, in that sense. Uh, in Brazil, we have a, a very strong community of researchers in, in many universities all over Brazil, studying and making uh, case analysis, comparative analysis on development cooperation, humanitarian cooperation, transparency, and normative uh, uh, structures of, of the cooperation system and IATI's work has been absent uh, absent in this discussion so I think a good way to start and even as a bridge to reach uh, the, the implementers to reach the governments could be uh, to, to, to speak out and to uh, to involve uh, researchers and academia more broadly in Brazil and Latin America, I imagine is, is almost the same way. Thank you so much. Jenny, over to you if you have any, not to put you on the spot, but any final thoughts you might have for the, the session or the community. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> the last session of the day. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was talking in, in the mute. Uh, Actually, uh, I, I'm very glad to 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 have Angel Padilla here because it it shows uh, that the government is is interested in, in the Yari uh, in, in in that initiative and, and, and that that's in, that that's the 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 main point I have to to it was an entry barrier actually for me. The, the the involvement of the government, but we already have in 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 Angel shows, and we can talk later with with the government about how to improve that that those gaps in the in the platform, and that's it. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Jenny, and Angel as well. <laughs> All right, over to you, Julio for some closing words. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's been great to share some experiences in the re from the region. So I do think this exchange will be really uh, fruitful in the future as well. So I will uh, like to be part of this community and also the work we've been doing uh, would be nice to share with you as, as well. And also to, to see what, um, as Luisa said, to promote more research on this side, because I think there's a lot of potential to use this data, but uh, we have not yet seen uh, a a wider use of it in the region, especially. So uh, thanks for, for all the, the, the information we have been uh, um, capturing these last two days. So I think it's great. And, and thanks for, for the, the space here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Julio. Great. Yeah, we definitely encourage you all to keep um, engaged with IADI. Um, and, you know, if you joined our registration list, we'll be adding you to, if you said yes, um, to our future communications and all that. But um, you know where we are, you know where the secretary is. So please, yeah, keep in touch. Um, it was really great session today. And I think actually we have some fruitful, tangible engagement coming out. So I think that was that was really the, the purpose and the goal. So I'm really glad to see that we um, accomplished that today. Um, so just in closing, I mean, Sarah, we'll just go to the next slide really quickly. Um, 
we are just at the end of our time. So if you had any additional um, questions or comments, we'll, we'll follow up with you, but you can also contact us. Um, our, our point of contact for the session is our colleague Sonder and his email is here. So feel free to reach out to us um, if any questions or comments on the session or any ways you wanna engage with us and we'll be in touch um, with everyone through kind of the, the Yachty communications channels as well. Um, and then we'll be recapping the whole virtual community exchange um, on our digital platform. So we do have this digital community platform called eadiconnect.org. We definitely encourage all of you to, to join it and to become members. This is a space where you can you know, chat with other transparency advocates and practitioners, ask questions, start conversations, find resources. So um, a really good place um, to, to find more resources. Um, so again, yeah, I thank you all for joining the session. Um, after this, there'll just be a quick 15 minute wrap up that will start in about um, five minutes. That'll be a wrap up of this two day virtual community exchange. So hopefully some of you can stick around for that very last final session just to kind of wrap things up and thank everyone and say goodbye. Um, but that'll be in this room in about five minutes. So thank you so much, everyone. Again, we really appreciate